The following episode contains discussions about suicide and self-harm. The information shared is one individual's personal experience and is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice, medical diagnosis, treatment, or care. If you or a loved one is struggling with mental illness or has suicidal thoughts, don't hesitate to reach out for help and dial 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or proceed to your local emergency room. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for those ages 10 to 24. And from 2000 to 2021, suicide rates among teens rose 52% according to the CDC. In today's episode, we will hear firsthand from a former carrier clinic patient, Jasmine. At just 14 years old, Jasmine faced unmanageable challenges, including multiple suicide attempts. Today, she's here to share her story of hope and healing, shedding light on the importance of mental health awareness and the power of perseverance. Thanks so much for being here today, Jasmine. We really appreciate you being so open, sharing your story, and um, just spreading some hope. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope I can help some people. I'm sure you will. So I have a bunch of questions, and I just want to say if I ask you anything at any point that you don't feel comfortable answering, just feel free to not. Okay. All right, great. So maybe let's just get started. Do you mind telling me a little bit about growing up and what it was like for you and mm-hmm. just a little bit of you know, your life? Um, Growing up, so I came from an immigrant household. My parents were kind of the first generation who came to the States. And I actually couldn't speak English English for the first few years. I had to go to ESL. And they, my parents were in this culture where mental illness didn't exist. It wasn't addressed. And they had no concept of what it was or any idea. And they always held high expectations for me. And just knowing that, I think I also held high expectations for myself. Um, It wasn't a terrible life. Everyone has their problems. My parents had problems, but nothing severe. And there was a certain point in middle school where just being extremely overwhelmed by schoolwork and feeling like I needed to be perfect for my family uh, just was extremely overwhelming and start it caused me to turn to some really bad coping mechanisms. My family did their best and that was just kind of the beginning getting into all my hospitalizations. Yeah. So you live with both your parents. Do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have two younger sisters. Uh, I lived with my grandma and my grandpa and now my aunt but my grandma passed last year so right now it's my grandpa and my aunt oh i'm sorry well that's a really full household to be growing up in um do you think that it was i guess helpful for you to have so much family around while you were kind of going through struggles or Mm, not really because uh my parents they weren't a very strong support system for me when i was younger because Again, they didn't know what it was. Yeah. When I first opened up to them about hurting myself, they took me somewhere to eat, sat me down, and said, it's just a phase, you'll get over it, everyone goes through this feeling. And I felt very invalidated. Uh, and that was their reaction to the initial telling them about it. So, And then my sisters were super young, they're younger than me. Mm-hmm. and. They wouldn't know what to say to me. I was 13, they'd be like 10 and 8, so. Yeah, there's probably also pressure in that too, that you kind of want to protect them. Oh yeah, absolutely. I felt like I had to be there for them. Uh, Even now, just being someone my sisters can talk to when my parents don't fully understand the concept of mental health. Right. What's good, you can be there for them. Mm -hmm. Um, So at what age do you think you started to realize, like, something I'm feeling isn't isn't normal or it doesn't feel right? Probably, well, honestly, in elementary school, I had a lot of insecurities and maybe more so than other kids, but I thought it was normal. I thought, oh, everyone gets super self-conscious and insecure. And maybe the very, very point that it happened I think I was 10 years old and I got a letter home from school saying like oh your child is overweight 
and you need to address that. And I saw it before my mom did. And I just like extreme body issues and just really hating myself for something that for something like that when I was so young. And it just kind of spiraled more when I was up to when I was 13. And a lot of the peop- my friends around me at the time were also engaging in self-injurious behavior. And that was what gave me the idea to also start doing it for myself. I was like, oh, if that's how they cope, what if I started doing it? Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask um, just about, like, who, I guess... Who, who's the first person you confided in saying, like, sharing, I guess, like, negative feelings like that? Probably my friend at the, t- um, who I'm still friends with to this day. She, she was the first person I told because she also was going through the same thing. In school, um, you know, you mentioned, like, a lot of your friends kind of had similar feelings mm-hmm. to you. Did that feel like you had some camaraderie with them at least? Or like was school hard for all of you to be there? I, it helped a little bit knowing I wasn't alone and how I was feeling, but also, also isolative at the same time because knowing everyone was going through something, it made it difficult to open up to anyone because, oh, you don't want to, you feel burdened or you don't want to burden them with your issues. What if that triggers them? And how are they going to come to you? And you knowing yourself, how are you not going to get triggered? Uh, it was like a difficult balance. That's a ton of weight for anyone, especially a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old. Yeah. That's that's a lot. Um, so you mentioned kind of like the idea of self-harm came from some friends mm-hmm. and stuff. Is that something you guys talked about? And No, 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 no. Uh, it's just... Uh, one day, my friend just was wearing a T-shirt, and I just saw the marks on on her arm, and that was it. And did you ask her? I lightly addressed it. I was like, everything okay? And she was just dismissive. So how did you, at the time, I just, it's so young. Like, mm-hmm. how did you kind of know that that's what that was? I think... That it was, you know, on purpose, too. Right. I think a big part of it was the internet because the internet is just a huge uh, community of people uh, and just you can just find out through there I was like what is this looking it up Mm -hmm. seeing how other people cope and at the time it was very very romanticized so even now it's still a little bit and that didn't help at all so what you found online, what was it telling you, if, if you remember? I mean, I know it's a while. I think it was less of what it was telling me and more of what I was seeing. Self-harm safety threads. If you're going to engage in this bad behavior, these are some harm reduction tips. At the end of the day, all those people were out to be there for each other. But at certain moments, it, it was kind of fuel. And just other people sharing their stories. Do you remember the lead up to like the first time you were gonna try hurting yourself? It must have been because of school. Mm-hmm. And it must have been, I love my parents, but uh, everyone has a difficult time handling their emotions. And perhaps they lashed out at me, got angry for some reason, I didn't do a chore, whatever. And um, something about finishing an assignment and just feeling extremely overwhelmed and really pressured and feeling like I was a failure to my parents, a failure to my school, to my friends, just a a lot of self-doubt, a lot of internalization, a lot of negative self-talk, just a lot self-deprecating thoughts. Like, I hate myself, I'm a bad person, things that weren't true. And feeling so overwhelmed, crying, having a meltdown, pure meltdown about it, and just seeing a blade and being like, okay, maybe this will help. And in that moment, it did. Where where were you? In your room? Just in my room. Yeah. And you just had a blade? I think it's just so easy to access, like, uh, because I'm also an artist. Okay. So just an Mm X-Acto or anything sharp. 
I just can't imagine. I mean, did you have fear in doing that? Like, you know, what if this goes too far or? I don't think so because again, because I was so chronically online at the time, uh, it reassured me, oh, if when you do this, remember to clean up like this after. Um, right, so you kind of had some guidance on like what to do, what not to do, how to. Yeah, yeah. So you said it did provide some relief, I guess, like in that moment. Like mm -hmm. afterwards, do you remember like how you felt? Did you think, oh, you know, I'm never going to try that again? Or was that something that you were kind of like, okay, well, this helped me, so maybe I'll do it again? It was more like this felt good in this moment, so I'm going to keep doing it every time I feel this way. So those thoughts, because all, all those thoughts, once I did it, just dissipated. And I was like my final thought was more so like I deserve this yeah I guess maybe it was like a physical way to release I guess yeah. the pain you had inside right mm -hmm. wow that's a lot and you were how old at that time I think 13 13 and so is that kind of how everything started in like your mental health journey did you mm -hmm. eventually I guess at what point did you then reach out and say hey I, I need help I think, so, early 2013, January, was maybe when I started, and then halfway through the year, I told my parents. They didn't do anything, and then maybe a month or two later, I was getting so, so overwhelmed with schoolwork and managing, after they now knowing what I do to myself, how they were treating me at the time. And then I told my guidance counselor, and then that's when they sent me to my first hospitalization. So your parents' reaction, I guess, was mostly kind of like denial? Maybe. They also just really didn't know anything. They didn't know how to react. I remember after my first few attempts, like seeing how to help your kid with depression books in their room and them just trying their best to understand at that point. They just no concept and in, in the in our culture it's just not back then it wasn't addressed at all yeah so maybe i guess they were just kind of hoping like like you said from the start like oh it's a phase like this will pass mm -hmm. or something like that yeah did your siblings ever notice like scarring or i'm not sure yeah. but eventually they did find out yeah so you said that took that was like half a year right you said that of just that kind of behavior yeah yeah until I guess it all came to light so I'm sure it probably was a pretty vivid memory but do you mind talking about your first hospitalization like what it was like and actually I don't remember it as much but yeah. it was only it was very short term it was mm -hmm. about three to four days I think at the time because I didn't have an attempt, I just came to my counselor and said, hey, I'm hurting myself, I need help. Um, because also when I told my parents, I was like, I need a psychiatrist, I need a therapist, and they were like, no, you're fine. I was hoping that getting into the hospital, I would be provided those things, and I was. It was very underwhelming, and it just gave me a terrible impression of the whole industry itself because it felt very clinical it felt very apathetic and like they were just doing their job and I was out of there so it wasn't a great experience yeah it seems like it was kind of just like a holding place to say like okay exactly we'll keep her safe for x amount of time once we hit these hours like oh well, it's just, exactly we'll let what her it back was out. yeah yeah that's not super helpful I also think it's super intuitive that at that young age you also and I guess this could also help with having the internet as a resource but no like I need a therapist I need a psychiatrist like oh yeah to be able to call out those things so young I I'm also just kind of in awe of that I was a really self-aware kid and also my friend who I opened up to at the time had those doctors and was telling me how helpful it was for her so I was like oh I need that clearly I guess what what came next after after coming out that first time so what came next was a partial program, which is also, it's like the hospitalization, but not as intense. So instead of staying overnight for a few days, it was maybe 
three to four times a week you would go to this place where they give you do some therapy groups so that's what came after do you think that helped some of it helped because there's different types of therapy groups that they can provide specifically the ones that talk about mindfulness uh, so grounding exercising exercises was really helpful but the ones where because everyone reacts differently to different forms of therapy and everyone has different things that help them and group therapy was just not for me I preferred one-on-one talks with a therapist because uh, during group sessions there was a facilitator that would lead a little but mostly it was the kids who would do the talking and I felt like I was doing a lot of talking but not getting a lot of feedback for and I also was very shy as a kid so I didn't get much out of those groups yeah I feel like it would probably help maybe to have like a balance of both like group and individual just because like you said like it's important for you to kind of hear feedback instead of just Mm -hmm. sharing and not really getting anything yeah okay so how long did that go for you were doing that kind of like partial therapy so my first hospitalization for was less than a week in december of 2013 and i was in a partial for a few weeks and then i was hospitalized again around the beginning of january was that also in coordination to like harming yourself they realized and then sent you or that one might have been an attempt i think like an attempted suicide yeah it might have been i guess at what point did did that cross from like self-harm to then saying like i kind of want to well end my life i was always thinking of it throughout hurting myself i was always thinking of what if i just go deeper what would happen um because the suicidal ideations, the thoughts, I have to live with them every day, every other day for the rest of my life. That that just that stuff just doesn't go away. So it, I always had it in my head. I think in January I just it's like oh therapy's not helping, nothing's working. I still feel this way. Still hate myself. What's the point of living if I have to live with these thoughts all the time? So that was the first attempt, probably. And then I guess that was also through cutting yourself that you just were like, I'll just Uh, cut deeper. I alternated. It was either that or it was an overdose. So one of them happened in January. What were you taking? It was just a mixture of anything. My prescription meds, over-the-counter meds, just anything. And did your parents find you? Is that? It was either they found me or they found me just throwing up because your body just wants that out of your system. And then I would tell them and they would take me to the hospital. It, it's like a very vivid memory of mine, one of my overdoses where my friends found me throwing up and I just like couldn't move. And my dad took me to the car and just I'm throwing up on myself as he's speeding down to the hospital. And that's a big reason why if people are speeding, I'm I'm like, oh, something might be happening in there. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I'm sure, makes you more aware mm-hmm. that you don't know what another car is doing Never know. There. Yeah, in kind of this like back and forth balance of like attempts and then hospitalizations mm-hmm. and how did that, I guess also impact just like the rest of your life, like with school, did you feel just so detached from everything? School was one of my biggest triggers. It was like my parents and then school and then whatever else. And it did impede a lot. I was put on some accommodations, obviously, like a 504 IEP, all that. So the the 504 is like a lesser form of what an IEP is. And honestly, if they gave me that IEP, which is just like two accommodations I needed, which was extended time on homework and excused absences for those days that I just couldn't get out of bed, I probably wouldn't have gone to all those hospitalizations. But because the school system at the time, I don't know if it's changed, was so weird and different, if I, I had to go through all of that until they finally gave me that. If they gave me that before I started going to the hospital, 
I probably wouldn't have attempted so much. It's, I mean, it's surprising and it's not. The surprising mm -hmm. part is that you did kind of start by going to the school and saying like, yeah. I'm looking for help, that like they didn't kind of flag it. But I also know that systems are rigid and yeah. you know, there's like certain criteria you have to hit for it certain was the criteria. things. Yeah, so that's really hard. It, and it still happens, like you, you need proof of disability of anything and because parents didn't take me to doctors and I guess I didn't have enough medical history for them to give me what I needed I just kept spiraling yeah so it was kind of this ping pong of you're out you're feeling bad you hurt yourself you go to the hospital you you were still kind of going in in and out of the group therapy and mm -hmm. yeah yeah I guess was there what was the turning point for you probably the residential uh because i was just going in hospital so much and that was when one time in the er i think the doctors came to me and was like you need to put in you need to be put into the the highest form of psychiatric care you need to be put in something long term because you just keep doing it over and over and over again and you need to be kept safe and monitored. So I was admitted June 18th, 2014, and I was there for nine months. So you're admitted, and what did that look like? It was different-ish, because it was a long-term care place, so there were a few more things you could have. Bigger space, obviously, you can walk around. And the biggest difference for me was outside of like, you have your therapist, you have your psychiatrist, you have these counselors that walk around and they're there for you 24 seven. And they are probably studying psychiatry. They're probably there for a multitude of reasons. They were, it, it ranged from early to late, to early thirties, late mid twenties. And these counselors were like the people that, that just changed my perspective the most out of anyone here. That's amazing. I'm, I'm guessing is it because they kind of connected with you a little deeper than maybe some of the other oh, yeah. clinicians could? Because I found with therapy, it's, it's very hit or miss. It's like finding the right doctor for you. Uh, finding the right person who can connect with you, be insightful with you, a share ex the biggest thing is shared experience uh, is what really hit it for me and being utterly empathetic and knowing that, oh, you've gone through it too. So you know, you, you are living proof of making it out alive. And a lot of therapists I encountered at that age were just super clinical, super, uh, I would tell them my problems and they'd, they'd say something that sound rehearsed, something that sounds like they haven't gone through it. And these counselors, I guess they also could get away with being a little more heart to heart. Then obviously there's some professional boundaries with therapy. Um, but they would say things to me like, I've been where you've been. I know how you're feeling. And let me remind you why there's so much more to the rest of your life than what you're feeling right now. And all of those counselors were just, it just clicked for me during my stay. Well, that's amazing. I'm, I'm glad that those people are there and mm -hmm. exist and can help people. So, um, so once you were in the residential setup, how long did you stay there and kind of what did it look like after? So I was there for nine months. I was a really, really good kid. Uh, a lot of the time, Counselors who didn't know me as well would be like, I don't even know why you're here because I behaved. I didn't ever have a crisis, maybe once or twice. So after I left, I think I was just, I found a good therapist, someone who was like my counselors, very insightful, very, very smart and self-aware. And because a lot of counseling is just reminding you of things you already know and you need to hear. So she was really good for me at that age. And then just, uh, I was put in an alternative school. 
I was there for a few months, but they thought it was not academically challenging enough for me, so I was put back to my district school. I was also, but because of the alternative school, I, I didn't have to go to a partial. What does that mean? The, um, the outpatient care that okay. comes after the inpatient stays. Because the school offered? Because the school okay. was there for me. I was back in my district school, and I had the IEP, which I was saying earlier, so I was doing a lot better. And then I was just, I guess, 10, 11 years recovered now. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Once you went back to your, your regular school, what was that transition like? Because, like, did your friends know what you had gone through? A few of them did know, because maybe two visited me while I was still in residential. And they were just, it's just overwhelming support and love. They were just like, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're back and I'm just glad you're alive. So very, very sweet welcome back. That's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's amazing. That's what you need, like the warm welcome. Yeah. How about your parents, like, in the transitions through all of what you went through? Like, did you see them make a change in being more understanding or...? There was one time in that, like, partial thing, the group therapy, where there was a parents group, and my parents went in one time, and they came out of it being like, oh, my gosh, Jess, you're such a good kid. <laughs> We, we, were, we thought we had it bad, but clearly we should be more grateful that you're doing your best and you're not as reactive as we see these other parents. And I think after everything that me and my family went through, they came to this conclusion that they're just so glad that I'm alive. And they don't care anymore how well I do in school. They told me this. They don't care what I want to do. They don't care about any of it as long as I was breathing because they just couldn't lose me again. I mean, that is the most important thing for a parent. Yeah. You know, but I I mean, it's definitely eye-opening, I'm sure, the perspective they had, like you said, from the group therapy. So I'm so glad that they've yeah. kind of, like, realized what what their situation was in it yeah they it took a lot for them to just the self-recognition to understand that they reacting certain ways to me would make me relapse and just being more cautious and something like that and it stayed I guess it stayed that way as as you've grown through these years it's so much better, so Good. much different from when I was little. And they, they've, I can talk to them now as an adult, and they do their best to understand. And, yeah. That's awesome. How do you think that it, I'm sure, I mean, there's probably a multitude of ways, but how do you think that this has changed you, just experiencing all of that as a person? Well, it's a... A major part of my narrative of who I am and when I'm counseling kids when I'm even when I'm teaching kids how I give advice to my friends to my sisters um, what fuels my art my whole identity a major part of it is recovery and integrating recovery into my life because all those skills that I learned when I was younger, and thank God I started when I was younger, and practicing them over and over and over again for years, years after, it's just now when I have a thought like that, a negative thought, it'll just change into a rational thought. So it's a huge part of, of me. And it sounds like you're using a lot of what you've learned to help other people. Do you mind sharing a little about how you're doing that? So around when I was 18, I started volunteering as a counselor for this youth support group. And it's funny because I entered that group as a kid, as someone who just wanted to see what it was about. And I talked to the person in charge 
And she's like, well, you're like super self-aware and very articulate. You should be working like for me. <laughs> so I started doing that. And then over the years, I would alternate between counseling, funnily enough, at residentials, uh, either with developmentally disabled adults or kids and patients uh, with behavioral issues or mental health issues. It would alternate between that or teaching, and it's usually teaching like second grade, kindergarten, and just using, if I saw someone who was going through something similar to what I was going through, I would talk them down to the same methods that I went through, and it was very helpful. It's super hard to hear everything you've gone through, but also super empowering of just like how you've taken all the hardship and what you've learned and your pain and really channeled it to to helping other people so that they don't have to experience it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So looking back now, knowing everything that you've learned and you've grown with, what would you tell 13-year-old Jasmine? There are so many things I would tell her, but I think the first thing I would tell her is it is not the end of the world. And I would remind her of who she was. I would tell her, you are not a bad person. You are feeling sad and you're feeling hateful and you're feeling angry because those things are human and it is okay to feel those emotions. They're not good or bad, they are just emotions. And I have my whole life ahead of me. You have your whole life ahead of you. That thing that you were sad about yesterday or today, you're not even gonna remember that a week later. That thing you felt insecure about, you're not even gonna remember that months later. All these little m memories that I would, that you would just have so many anxiety attacks over, they are not defining to who you are. And look forward to the future, look forward to when you can travel, when you can make art, when you can live your life freely, not feeling so inhibited by your emotions. And that it's so cheesy that everything's gonna be okay, everything works out. It is gonna suck sometimes, and that's okay. Yeah, I think it's such a realistic mm -hmm. outlook, you know? Things aren't always gonna be great. No, but that's life. Yeah, but you can get through it. It sounds like art is also another big piece of like an outlet for you. Is that something that you kind of learned along in your journey of like, this is a really good way for me to cope? Actually, I've ma been making art since like I started writing, like since I was very, very little. When I was a kid, I was just like, I will be an artist. That is, this is my whole life. And it's because when you're in those settings, you don't have your electronics. I think that was the most art I've ever made in my life. I would draw every day, every single day, all the time. The, the art therapist was my best friend and I would just create and create and it just got more into it, being in that setting. Is, is there anything else, I guess, on a day-to-day on a -day basis that you use for coping that, again, young Jasmine like didn't know about yet? Writing? I wrote a lot, and writing is still something that is very helpful to me, and also grounding exercises. So things are simply as reminding of you to be in the moment. Because when you're anxious, when you're depressed, sometimes you linger on the past, or you get anxious about the future, or you're upset about present things, but questions like, where am I? What day is it? What am I wearing? How do my clothes feel? What's the weather reminding of you where you are and how safe it is? So mindfulness. Yeah, it's a bit grounding. Mm -hmm. When it comes to writing, is there something you like to write in particular? Are you journaling? Is it like fiction? Are you writing stories or oh, it's poems just, or questions? It's journaling. Yeah. Yeah. It's like getting all those thoughts into my head, uh, out of my head, all those negative thoughts. Oh, I'm terrible. Why can't I be better? And then looking at it and then changing it into, I am not a bad person. I, I am, should not feel guilty about this. Just 
changing those. And it just brought me back to my truths. It's super powerful. Have you ever looked back on your journals? And I at least know for me, I've journaled before. And sometimes you look back and you're like, I don't even know that person. Mm. Have you ever felt that? Yeah, I actually, I was, I had a poetic intervention class in, in college. And one of the assignments, the final assignment was called retranslation. And I took my old journal entries from when I was in residential and retranslated them into how I would write them now to this day. And looking back at them is such a wild, wild thing because it, it's just so hung up, so stuck. So it's just a lot of overthinking and a lot of very, very irrational thoughts. I think that's why journaling is also so powerful, though, because it can really help you see how much you've grown. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's you could you could just tell reading it like, oh, yeah, that that was a really depressed 14 year old right there. Yeah. Like looking all that was a really dark time. Mm -hmm. So glad that that's passed, you know? Yeah, that's great. So I guess anyone else who is struggling right now with anxiety, depression, thoughts of self-harm or suicide, like what, what would you tell them to do or any bits of hope they could kind of take away from this? It's really, really difficult. And everyone says this, but it's true. You have to get help. You have to do something because when you are stuck, in that mentality and you have no support or you feel like you have no support and you're going to get comfortable. You're going to get comfortable being sad. You're going to get comfortable being stuck and depressed. And if you don't change, and change is uncomfortable, but it is necessary. If you don't do something to change that, you will be like that forever. And do you really want that? Do you want to be depressed every day? Do you want to be sad all the time? It's exhausting. So you just do something about it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Jasmine. This was amazing of you to open up and share all of this like really personal stuff. I appreciate it. And hopefully someone listening or watching can kind of take away from your story and leave feeling like, you know what, I'm ready to take that step in the right direction. Yeah, of course. The information shared is one individual's personal experience and is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice, medical diagnosis, treatment, or care. If you or a loved one is struggling with mental illness or has suicidal thoughts, don't hesitate to reach out for help and dial 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline or proceed to your local emergency room.